Rade, Rade. We continue then the um, Deva, this reading um, that Guru Deva has given me, in which I carry out with great uh, pleasure and great, uh, great honor. And I, I give, send to him my, my dandavats and my respect and my obeisances and pray to him to help me see clearly and speak truthfully. Yes. This is the ninth uh, class now, which I'm very, 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 very happy about. <laughs> the ninth class. And just to give a little reminder, um, let's go back to where we started just for one minute and then we'll, we'll continue. And where we started on, on, on Gurudev's instruction and with his inspiration, we started with the introduction to to Bhagavad Gita written by Prabhupada. I just wanted you to remind you of three lines from that introduction that we read before, but they're good to be repeated. So this is what Prabhupada said in the introduction. We have forgotten our eternal relationship with the Lord. Every living being out of many, many billions and trillions of living beings has a particular relationship with the Lord eternally. That is called Svarupa. By the process of devotional service, one can revive that Svarupa. And that stage is called Svarupa Siddhi, or perfection of one's constitutional position. This is our this is our inspiration for the class. It's the inspiration that Gurudev led us to. Sorry, excuse me, Hudava. Ah, Radhe Radhe, everybody. Radhe Radhe. Aspetta un attimo. Italian. Yes. Voilà. Okay. So the starting point that we are seeking to revive our constitutional position, which is our natural position, which is the one which is most authentic to us, and which, and this is the beautiful news, the beautiful part, is one of loving relationship to God. So wherever this loving relationship to God is missing, it's where we have gone away from our authentic self, gone away from our soul consciousness, gone away from our svarup. Starting from this really simple idea, simple and very, very powerful idea, then we started our, we started our reading of Bhagavad Gita and we tried to understand better how this very old text mm, expresses that starting point and how it brings us to a a better understanding of bhakti, of Raganuga bhakti, and how it helps us see the presence and the influence of Radharani, 
in the pastimes of Krishna. So it helps us to see the presence of Radha Mohan in the, the way that the universe is being organized and, and, and governed. And finally, it helps us to understand better what our, what our bhakti practice is, namely trying to assume Mantari Bhav, trying to assume, assume the, the mood, the feeling, the loving uh, feeling of one who serves the uh, divine loving relation. And the divine loving relation is God itself. So our practice as bhakta is to do the most we can to support that loving relation, to, to, to serve God by supporting that loving relation, which is prema, which is divine love. We do it in many, many ways through our sadhana, through our service to guru, through our service to others. But the aim of all that practice is to increase love in the universe, to increase the strength and the, and the, and the spreading of uh, prema in the world. And this is how we've read Bhagavad Gita so far. Um, we've read it as a kind of introduction to bhakti, an introduction to uh, the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu well before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu appeared. And so it's we're trying to understand better the place of Radha, Radharani in, in uh, the Bhagavad Gita and in our lives. That's our general project there as, as kind of a reminder, kind of an introduction. Last week, um, we talked about personality, what a personality is. It's, it's a very common word. We use it all the time. In, in daily life. So we want to understand what a personality of Godhead is. This is the way that Prabhupada translates the word Bhagavan, God, God with a personality. So what does it mean to say that God has a personality? It's a very strange thing. People have personalities. Individual jivas have personalities, but what does it mean to say that God has one? And the way we looked at it last week, starting with verse um, 5, 9.5, was to try to understand Krishna's relationship to his own creation. So we saw in verse 5, I'm going to read it again for you in, in a moment. We saw in verse 5 that Krishna is the universe, creator of the universe, identical with the universe, and also that he acts in that universe. So actually... We started last week with 9.5, but these all these verses here and these, uh, let's say from 9.4 to 9.10, so it'll be today also and, and, and next week too, and then we'll finish, I think, with that. They're all about this very strange relationship between Krishna and Krishna's creation. And very strange, I say very strange, because Krishna is the universe. Krishna is everything. And he is in the universe. So what can it be to be to both these things at the same time? The way I tried to explain it last week was to say that Krishna is Brahma. Krishna is absolute reality. Krishna is reality itself. Everything that is real is Krishna. That's what Brahma means. That's one aspect of Krishna, one aspect of God. But he has another aspect. Well, he has two more aspects, but the, the one we focus on is Bhagavan, the one who 
has a personality. Like I said, the personality of Godhead. We're not reading the Brahmad Gita, I said last week. We're reading the Bhagavad Gita. So before we said many times that God has three aspects, Brahma, Bhagavan, and Paramatma. And now we're focusing on the first two. So Krishna as, as reality is Brahma, and as somebody in that reality, with a personality, having pastimes, relating to other jivas, relating to every other spirit souls, is Bhagavan. That's the aspect. So two sides. This creates a lot more questions, I think. It doesn't make this it so much easier, but it's it's a start. Maybe the most important question that it raises for us is if Krishna is acting in the world, if Krishna appears in the world and is doing things, is taking actions, what rules does he have to follow? Does he have to follow the same rules as other jivas? Well, no, not exactly. What power, what is the power that directs him? What governs Krishna in his pastimes in the world? Does he have limitations? Does he have things he cannot do? Does he have things that he wants to do? Does he have feelings? And this all leads us to a larger discussion about the personality of God and about what a personality is. And we said that a personality is something that makes someone unique, makes them different. It breaks the pattern. It makes, them, makes someone different from the next person. It's something that uh, is not universal. It's not always predictable. It's not always logical. It's not always rational. Sometimes it's outside of reason. If I were a computer, if I were a robot, you would know what I'm going to do. There would be no surprises. You would have complete knowledge of what governs me. It would be logic and reason. But if I'm a personality, then there's some things we don't know. Then there's something outside of logic. There's something outside of reason. There's something opposed to predictable behavior. And another word for all those things put together is love. A personality is someone, something that is governed by love. And this is what inspires us to wonder when we talk about personality of Godhead, how Krishna is governed by love in his pastimes. And as we all know, because as students of Gurudev, we all have PhDs in Bhakti, by reading the most advanced books, Vilapa Kusmanjari and Radha Rasa Zudaniti, we know what governs Krishna in these pastimes. It's the loving desires of Radharani. So there's a very strong way of arguing or understanding the presence of love in Krishna's activities all through time, and therefore the presence of Radharani in his activities all through time, even though she's not named. So when we take away all the logic and rationality and universality and think about what a personality is, we can only say that it's a loving spiritual self. And when we attribute this quality to God, to Krishna, we're thinking about something very beautiful, very powerful. And we're thinking about a, a concept of love, which is very powerful 
uh, as well. The core of personality, the basis of personality is love. The basis of divine personality, it's divine love. Then last time we talked, well, I talked a lot, a lot more about personality last time. I won't repeat uh, myself. But if we understand Krishna as having personality, as love being a governing force, maybe the only governing force of the universe, then it helps us to understand many things. We talked about faith. We talked about bhav. We talked about how bhav is given from one to another, from guru to devotee. We talked about parampara. And we talked about what Radha Rani's energy is among all the energies that Krishna possesses, all the, among the many kinds of shakti, the many kinds of potency that he has. Radha Rani is most clearly one of those. So then if we move forward towards the, the next verse, what we're trying to understand, we'll start at 9.6 now. What we're trying to understand is, is what this link means between Krishna being everything and Krishna being governed by loving energy within the creation. The, so what is the, what is the link between the universe and the love that happens in the universe, the love that is realized in the universe, the love that's realized in, in Krishna's uh, pastimes. Um, and of course, the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is one answer to this, one explanation to this. In fact, he's really the primary explanation. That's why we're so blessed in our time, as is often said in our discussions, we're so fortunate to live in the era of Mahaprabhu, to live in the time after he brought this message and clarified this for us. Mahaprabhu is Krishna, of course. Mahaprabhu is a, a form, and a, a, an appearance of Krishna. But there's something special that happens with Mahaprabhu, which makes it completely unique and completely, his life completely uh, original. And that is Mahaprabhu is Krishna with a thirst to understand himself. A, a God who wants to use godly power to discover himself. And of course, as you know, one particular aspect of himself, namely the experience of love, of loving rather, let's be clear. Krishna was always the object of love, but through Mahaprabhu, he's able to ask the question, what is it, what is it to be loving? What is it to love infinitely? Huh? So if you like, Gurudev likes to call me a researcher, but I think that I, I will say now that Mahaprabhu is also a researcher. Mahaprabhu is doing research on what it means to be God. He's doing research on mm, the highest experience possible in the world that he created. Namely, the experience of love. So in this sense, and this is why we are so fortunate, the appearance of Mahaprabhu is, is the completion, the perfection of Bhagavan. It's the perfection of personality. Because the missing part in our understanding of what the personality of Godhead is, was love. That's, been the, that's the answer to the question of personality. It's love. And Mahaprabhu has brought the answer to that by showing us what it's like, what, how God loves, what divine love is, what divine loving is. 
So Mahaprabhu's appearance is a completion, a full completion of God as lover. God as loving actor. And, and uh, loving relation as, as really the, the, the highest form of existence. Absolute reality. So you could say, I talked many times about, and also just now, about this opposition between Krishna as Brahma, as reality, and Krishna as Bhagavan, as personality. In Mahaprabhu, they in some sense come together. And we understand that the reality itself is prema. That is that is absolute reality. So whereas it, Prema was hidden in the personality of Godhead, in the Bhagavan aspect, we discover it through Mahaprabhu as being the Brahma aspect, as the very substance, as the very reality of the, of the universe. And now it's our task as Bhakta, through our different forms of sadhana, to understand what that means with the, the help and the blessing of, of Gurudev. That last verse, that the, the verse 9.5 that we had last week, just let me repeat it, it's short. It says, all beings are in me, but I am not in them. And then Prabhu, Prabhupada comments, actually he commented earlier, he said the following, one should not conclude that because he is spread all over, he has lost his personal existence. He is, of course, Krishna. So she, we wouldn't think, we shouldn't think that just because he's Brahma, because he is everything, that he is universal and spread thinly like butter over a piece of bread. No, he has not lost the personality. He has not lost that loving, that loving dimension, the, the dimension of divine love, only because he's absolute. Mahaprabhu shows us, as I said a moment ago, that the actual reality is that prema. In chapter six, and now we'll move forward. Let me get out my. The text. Let's look at, uh, let's look together at um, verse six. There it is. It's an example. So Prabhupada gives us an example essentially, of, when, of what he's talking about when he says that I do not disappear in, in the absoluteness of the creation I've made. And it's a simple example, but it can tell us a lot. And I want to take a big hop and to rely, try to relate it to something that Gurudev talks about quite often. So you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> The verse says, as the mighty wind blowing everywhere always rests in ethereal space, know that in the same manner, all beings rest in me. So the wind blows, the wind is blowing in the world, according to this verse, in, a, in some sort of enclosed space. And that enclosed space is reality. The wind is kind of the manifestation of, of things that are happening inside reality. And remember again, then, Krishna is both the reality and the wind and what's going on inside that reality. Then Prabhupada comments. Let's see down here. He says, for the ordinary person, it is almost inconceivable 
how the huge material creation is resting in him. But the Lord is giving an example, which may help us to understand. Well, we can agree that it's difficult to conceive, can't we? It's very difficult to conceive of the universe, that Krishna is the universe. It's easier to think in the kind of Abrahamic way, that is in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, that God created, that God existed first, and then created something as an object, and then looks at it from outside. That's quite easier to think, and maybe that's why we think that way often. This is something different. It's that Krishna is in everything. Krishna is in all the things around you. Krishna is in your body, but not only the material things. Krishna is in the smell of roses. Krishna is in the grammar that organizes language. Krishna is in the, the, the laws of gravity. Krishna is in all these things, is, is the universe. It's really quite uh, impossible to understand, <laughs> quite extraordinary. But so Krishna is all that, and then he comes and he performs his leelas inside this reality. So he's reality itself, and he's doing these, these, uh, these leelas. Prabhupada continues, space is the biggest manifestation we can conceive. The cosmic manifestation rests in space. Space permits the movement of even the atoms and on up to the greatest planets, the sun and the moon. Although the sky or wind or air is great, Still, it is situated within space. Space is not beyond the sky. So we have this idea of the winds flowing within space. And winds are what come and go, like we live in the space. We come and go. Winds are moving. They depend on the space. They, they, they live inside the space. They are reality inside the space. And Prabhupada wants to use this example to help us understand how Krishna can have activities within, within the uh, universe that he himself has created and is. But let's take this in a different direction which is a bit uh, risky, but uh, I had the inspiration this morning, so I thought I would tell you about it. Let's try to compare the image of the wind in the sky that Prabhupada gives, that, that Bhagavad Gita gives us, and the image of the waves of love in the ocean of Bhav that Gurudev tells us about, and that we see in Vilapakus Majari many, many times in other Bhakti texts. We compare the wind in the sky and the waves in the ocean. Because I think they remind us of each other. The winds, like the waves, rise and fall. They come and go. The winds have a personality. Just like the, the endless emotion, waves of emotion in the ocean of Bob that we talk about so much. The waves come and go. The emotion rises in intensity and falls in intensity, rises in frequency and goes down in frequency. So just like in the sky of reality, there are waves of air, the wind, the wind is a varying intensity of our experience of our existence. Sometimes it's strong. We feel very much alive and present. Sometimes it's less strong. Sometimes it's very, very erratic, and we feel erratically uh, present in our existence. And sometimes it's less erratic. Just like the waves 
of Bav in the ocean of love that we talk about. They come and go and remind us, give us that experience of love. The example of the wind shows how we can have an experience of our existence. The wind is in the sky, but the sky is not dependent upon the wind, just like the waves are in the ocean, but the ocean is not dependent upon the waves. There can be oceans without waves as well. <clears throat> Someone who didn't feel the wind, who sort of blew back and forth without knowing that there was a wind going on, would not know he existed would not have a relationship to the truth about his creation, would not realize his existence. Similarly, as Gurudev explains to us, it's the flowing back and forth of the waves of Bhav that remind us of, of, of the universal love. And only when we are fixed in Stai Bhav, only when we are fixed can we feel the waves flowing against us, rising and, and falling with increasing frequency and less frequency, ebb and flow in and out, the waves of emotion. Only by feeling those waves, because we're fixed, can we uh, feel the ocean uh, of love. The same can be said about feeling the wind in this example about feeling existence. So an impersonalist, someone who doesn't think that God has a personality, would think that the wind, that's the reality. There's nothing out there. There's only wind. So we, we blow back and forth in the wind and we feel nothing. Just like an impersonalist of bhakti would not have staibhav and would flow back and forth with the waves and splash around and not feel anything and would not know that love, that prema, is the governing force of everything. The impersonalist thinks that Krishna is only Brahma, is only reality, no personality. And the same goes for someone who does not understand that the waves in the ocean are what are communicating the variations in the experience of, of Prema. So we could almost talk about a personalist Bhakta and an impersonalist bhakta, though I think an impersonalist bhakta might be impossible, but anyone, someone who is immersed in bhakti, has established stai bhav, is fixed, and can feel the waves flowing against him or her, can also feel the prema, then, can know the prema, can experience the prema. And that's the virtue of... of um, that's the virtue of this idea of waves. And I think it can be applied to the idea of wind as well. Next, uh, Prabhupada, let's see, goes on to talk about will, the will of God. He says, similarly, all the wonderful cosmic manifestations are existing by the supreme will of God. And all of them are subordinate to the supreme will. As we generally say, Prabhupada says, not a blade of grass moves without the will of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So already we see that one form of personality is will, to want things, and to not want other things, to have a choice, to understand that the world has many possibilities, many potentialities, many paths. One who has personality knows that there's choice. 
a god who has personality knows he has choice. And that permits us to ask, what is guiding his choice? If Krishna has a will, if Krishna wants something and does not want something else, then suddenly we again find an invisible governing force in Krishna's energies, something that's guiding his choices, something that's guiding his will, something that's determining that he chooses one thing to move the blade of grass, for example, and not the other. What determines it? It's not universal, because if it were, then it would always happen the same way. What guides his actions? You know what I'm going to say. It's the loving energy of Radharani, who is behind, who is influencing the choice, who is influencing the will, who is providing the energy to think other things, to follow other courses. Prabhupada continues, still he is aloof from, oops, I need to move the text just a minute. Oop. There you are. Still he is aloof. From everything. As space is always aloof from the activities of the atmosphere. Aloof, this means indifferent, not caring, not attached. It's the impersonal. So Krishna is in this sense, impersonal and indifferent, but within the world, he's acting and he is personal and uh, let's say um, engaged. So Prabhupada in a way is giving us more evidence of the personality, what kind of personality Krishna is, when he's acting in the world. A personality which is opposed to the, let's say the aloof aspect of God, the indifferent active act aspect of God. And Prabhupada continues in the Upanishads. It is stated, it is out of fear of the Supreme Lord that the wind is blowing. So the, the, the personality of Godhead decides that the wind should blow, that the blades of grass should bend. And maybe it's just a metaphor, but in the Upanishads, we see the word fear. And fear is, of course, an emotion. The Upanishads are expressing the idea that the material reality is reacting with an emotion to the personality of Godhead. That it's a kind of bhav, a kind of feeling that is directing the activities of the world, the wind in this case, a relation of of, of emotion, a relation of fear is a relation of emotion. So the activities in the created universe have an emotional relation to the creator. One which then goes very well together with our idea about personality being guided by feelings, by emotion as well. Um, Prabhupada continues. In the Garga Upanishad, also it is stated by the supreme order under the superintendence of the supreme personality of Godhead, the moon, the sun, and the great planets are moving.
another aspect of personality. The planets could very well not be moving. They could be moving the other direction. They could move, be spinning around in another way. All of these are choices that were made uh, by the will of God through the personality of God and which need to be explained by something which is invisible to us that's hiding in the personality. It's the secret knowledge we talked about before. What is it that determined that the things that Krishna acts upon in the world are the way that they are? This is the mystery that we're answering. That's the question that we're answering uh, with the idea of Radharani. Finally, in the Brahma Samhita, this is also stated. And then, uh, let's see, he completes, completes the commentary in the following way. There is also a description of the movement of the sun. And it is said that the sun is considered to be one of the eyes of the Supreme Lord and that it has immense potency to diffuse heat and light. Here in this part of the commentary, we need to be attentive to the word potency. Because potency belongs to personality. What is potency? This is the word we usually use to translate Sanskrit shakti, energy. But potency is a, a very special kind of an energy. Potency is energy that can or cannot be used. It's, it's energy that's stored. It's a type that we have in a kind of tank, in a pot that we can take out and apply or not. Potency is potential, possible energy. Potency is something we can use according to mood. We can use or cannot use or decide not to use according to mood, according to what we want. So it's a potential, it's a possibility. Maybe it could be, maybe it cannot be. Again, it's governed by another force. Potency is always object of a decision which is governed by some other kind of thinking, some other kind of uh, some other kind of, of power. The question then is what is governing? And though the evidence is not very clear here, we think that this governing has something to do with Radharani. The secret missing, I say missing because she's not in the text, but not really missing. The governing potency of Krishna is Radharani. And then finally, Prabhupada says, still it is moving in its prescribed orbit, now we're in the planets, by the order of and the supreme will of Govinda. So from the Vedic literature, we can find evidence that this material manifestation, which appears to us to be very wonderful and great, is under the complete control of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Just the fact that Prabhupada tells us that it's wonderful and great, that the world appears to us as beautiful, as wonderful. This is already the evidence of the love behind it. If the world were pure logic, if the world were only reason, only mathematics, there would be no beauty. We would see no beauty. We would see nothing. We would see white. That the world appears to us as wonderful and great. 
being under the control of the personality of God is crystal clear evidence that there is love which structures that world. That prema is the governing, the governing force of that world. Then Prabhupada finishes by saying this will be further explained in the, in the later verses of the chapter. The next verse, chapter, uh, verse seven, um, continues the theme about, let me look you in the eyes there for a minute. It, the verse continues the theme of how, what it means that Krishna is do, having lilas, is acting, is doing action inside uh, a world that he himself created. And what this means to, that to say that he has a, a personality in that world, that he has choice, that he has a will, that he has preferences. And what, what determines these preferences, what makes Krishna want to make this planet spin from left to right and not from right to left, or to make the wind blow or to make the, the grass grow. And again, in this next verse, we're going to talk about potency. And potency is very, very important. Yes, it translates shakti, energy, but it's also important because uh, it has this idea of potential, of choice, that God can choose to act in one way or another, that God can react to other input that he receives, namely input in the form of uh, desires, longing, greed, love. These are the inputs which help him or drive him to decide to use the potency that he uh, possesses. Let's, uh, let's have a look. So the verse says, O son of Kunti, Arjuna, at the end of the millennium, every material manifestation enters into my nature. And at the beginning of another millennium, by my potency, I again create. This is describing as the the way the the way the the epochs the eras of of the creation come and go so at the end of this millennium when all the events in our reality have played out what is predicted by the vedas well that krishna will roll it all back up i think that's the word he uses here doesn't he i No, he doesn't have word, but he will, he will, Krishna will roll up reality, all the material beings that exist, they will be again transformed into pure soul, and they will lose their material energy, and uh, he will recreate, so everything will be annihilated, and he will recreate in the next era, the new reality, and then reinsert those same souls, according to their samskara, according to their karmic positions, into the new reality. Of course, as you know, the souls never disappear. They just transmute from one to another. So this is a very general idea about Vedic cosmology, if you like, uh, that's in the text. But there's one or two things we can point to that, that have something to say about uh, our interpretation. And the main one is what he says about potency. And once again, potency employs, Im implies choice. My poten potency, my potential, the energy I have gives me the liberty to choose the way I want to put the world together, what I want to put into the world. 
And that implies that there is a potential. This implies that somehow Krishna is giving input about what he should put into the world, how he should fill the world with material manifestations. And we want to understand what is that input? How does his personality, and in, in, in particular, how does the love that is part of his personality influence the creation that he makes and the, and the activities that he has in the creation. And Prabhupada's comments, a very short purport this time. The creation, the maintenance and annihilation of the material cosmic manifestation is completely dependent on the supreme will of the personality of Godhead. It's his will that decides of the creation and the maintenance and the annihilation. It's what he chooses. It's what his personality leads him to want and to think and to do. And part of that personality is the energy of, of prema. So there in this comment in this part of the purport, we're talking about the personality of God, Bhagavan. But look, in the next sentence of the purport, Prabhupada talks about Brahma, about the, the aspect of God as being reality. And he says, at the end of the millennium, he's commenting on the verse, at the end of the millennium means at the death of Brahma when reality such as it is uh, stops. Brahma lives on for 100 years, and this one day, is calculated at, oh my dear, is that 4 trillion, 4 trillion, 300,000 billion of our earthly years. His night is of the same duration. His month consists of 30 such days and nights, and his year of 12 months. Well, I think it's 4 billion 300 million. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I just saw so many zeros, and I was blinded by the zeros. We agree it's quite long. Uh, after 100 such years, when Brahma dies, the devastation, so reality as it was, disappears, Brahma dies. The devastation of annihilation takes place. This means that the energy manifested by the Supreme Lord is again wound up in himself. That's where I got the word wound up. I was thinking it was in the verse, but it's in Prabhupada. So wound up kind of like a spring. When, uh, when Krishna decides to create all the material manifestations in the world, he pulls out the string. Here, I, I need to put on the screen so you can see my hands. <laughs> so he winds out the string, the spring of the long spring. And this is all the energy, the energy that he holds, and he puts it into reality. And when the millennium is over, it's like one of these measuring tapes with a spring in it, and you pull it out. And when you let it go, bzup, it pops back in. This is what happens with all the energy that Krishna has. At the end of the millennium, he presses the button, and the energy zooms back into into, into him. And all the souls that were there are preserved, though their material forms are not. And all the energy is preserved as well. It's loaded back up into that spring. So it's a very nice, I don't know if you like, uh, metaphor for what happens. The, the reality, the energy winds back up, and he can use it for something else again in the next millennium. And that's exactly what he does. Uh, and then to finish, 
finish the purport. Um, then again, when there is need to manifest the cosmic world, it is done by his will. Although I am one, I shall become many. This means that he decides to expand. And it's done by his will. It's done by his personality. It's done by the non-universal, non-rational, non-logical parts of his, pers of, of, his, of his being, his personality. This is a Ved the Vedic aphorism. He expands himself in the material energy and the whole cosmic manifestation again takes place. So he says, now it's time. He decides now it's time. And now it's going to be like this. Now I'm going to organize the world this way. And that's the way the, the energy of the world unfolds. Um, I think we'll start on, unless there's some comments or input or sharing or questions, then we can take a look at one more verse. Otherwise, I'm glad to stop here. It's a lot of talking and it's, some of it's very difficult, I know. So if anyone would like to, to share or change the mood or, or sing a song, sing a song for Shri Prem, Shri, Shri Prem and Gaura Prem, Shri Prem and Gaura Prem, then that would be nice. Shri Priya, like Priya. Shri Dal and Kishori's daughter, also the same name, and Gaura oh. Prem. Sorry, Shri Priya. Shri Priya fell asleep by your sharing, actually, now. Oh, good. Great uh, teacher than I am. That's... <laughs> I'm very grateful. Thank you. <laughs> That's the first time I say her name. I won't, I won't err again. No problem, really. Actually, I think I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so I stopped the car because also I was driving now. Um, so what you just said that actually, uh, Krishna is um, creating all creation, all material world and all living entity um, means also that in our, or let's say in my concept, when we talk about material life and spiritual life, means that as long as we can see a material life, there is still a lack of being born pointed on being a Dasi of Radharani, because when we are one point, that then we could see also everything is spiritual. Is this right, or is this a wrong understanding now? Um, the, the, uh, it's partially right. There are several things in, in, what you, in what you ask. When the material world is created, and the souls are put back into material form through the energy of Maya, then this also, then it's material. Then it's not, it's not uh, one pointed. But it also creates the jivas that can do this, can that can find their way to one pointedness, can find their way to their spiritual identities. It's through the existence in the material world that we're able to do our practice, to uh, to become unified with to become unified with Radha Mohan. So it's almost, um, it's almost a, a paradox, but we need our bodies to do seva. We need our bodies to do service. When they were stuck in their purely spiritual forms before Krishna created the universe, they are not liberated. They're just waiting. So they could be waiting to go back into existence as, as, as a as a pig or a cow or whatever it might be. They're just, they're just in waiting, and then they'll be reinserted in the appropriate body. So it's not quite the same thing, but it's a good reminder that, that material existence is important for that reason, that we can serve, 
and we can we can do our service and we can do our sadhana and we can and we can uh, we can find our our svaru. we need our bodies for this it's not just uh, it's not just uh, uh, retreating into the soul that uh, that uh, allows this to happen hope that was clear i hope you're not driving car too while you're talking <laughs> Any other comments? Gurudev, did you want to? Only I can say beautiful. Beautiful. You explain and nice. Hmm. Very nice. All are very happy. <laughs> Yeah. Karuna. Oh, Chirikude. Are you good? I am okay. You are, are you okay? Very nice. Very okay. happy. Okay. Good. Thank you, Dava. Thank you very much. Mm. Very, very good. Mm. Very nice. Okay. I think I think we stop here. It's a bit difficult material. Maybe it's a bit that's enough for one day. Um, uh, Uda uh, and everybody, um, since it's a, it's a, it's a time for for sharing, I I just yeah. wanted to add something. Um, um just you know. I was hesitating whether I should share it or not, but 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 uh, I just wanted to add that uh, that this scale of this subject of uh, of this class uh, is just um, you know in 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 every way it's the scale is just like uncomprehensible. It's the time scale, the space scale, and and in every sense like like the. the that Krishna is the, is the source of all creation, you know, and, and these, these, you know, so, so you, so you see what I mean. Yes. So, so it's like for the, for the mind, it's, 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 it's impossible to comprehend, you know, but this class is so great because it shows us um, the dimension of love and the existence of love in Bhagavad Gita and in those, in these um, deep subjects that we, that we discuss. And my personal uh, sort of, sort of this flash moment or, or little realization is just that this, this, uh, this, uh, when, when love enters the discussion and, and we suddenly see the presence of Radharani everywhere, this actually helps me to comprehend everything and to understand everything. Uh. <laughs> Otherwise, uncomprehensible. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Beautiful. This is really this is, uh, such a wonderful <laughs> news. <laughs> <laughs> and it's... Um, mm, it, it's quite this, true, the first is, thing yeah. you say, too. It's uh, the scale of the book is is uh, makes your head uh, pop. Yeah, and but unfortunately, I am governed personally. I am governed by the book. I have to follow the book. <laughs> and then yeah, suddenly, Prabhupada is talking about four billion years, and uh, it's it's hard to. Uh, but there we are. I do my best. Yes. Yes. Hmm? I just really, really feel that when. When the when the aspect of love is is uncovered, it's just everything starts making sense, yeah. and everything is somehow you know I can grasp and I can I can feel and I can understand, and it, it absolutely makes sense. So that's that's the real beauty of it. 
That's absolutely, it's such an important message that you're bringing there, uh, Tishod. This is, it's not an accident that this is true. Mm. It's because that the love is, is lurking, it's hiding right below the surface of everything. And the moment we open it up just a little bit and let it come out, everything makes sense. Yeah. So you put your finger right on the, the reality of the matter. So thank you so much, Uda and, and everyone. Yes. Rade Suniti, did you want to share? I saw your smiling yes. face appearing there. I thought maybe you would. <laughs> no, I, I agree completely with what Kishore said that uh, we are sitting here completely lost by the all these pictures that you put so beautifully also together about the omnipotence and you know how Krishna is pervading everything he is, the creation. And then yeah, when the sentence love comes, I or the, the word love comes, or Shimatya Radhika is the one who is, you know, giving him even personality also. And he's Lord Chaitanya, he becomes, you know, immersed in her personality. That is so beautiful to remember. And then we feel again so much hope and so much happiness. Uh, like you said, before we get lost. <laughs> Very nice point, Kishore. I agree, 108%. Mm. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Yeah. That's really nicely said, Suniti. Yeah. Well, next next week it start. We start the book starts to move towards uh, devotion a bit more explicitly. So it might even be easier to make Radharani come out in the light and and talk to us. We want to show us about without Radharani. And with Radharani, how it becomes sweet. Mm. Right? Right. But love is so important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But Thank you are very intelligently detailed explaining what is mentioned there. So beautiful. Wow. Oh, that's clear. I'm surprised. Karuna, you agree with me? You have to say... Yes, good. Yes, it's very good. I, I am agree. That he will also enjoy when he will listen to Buddha. Yeah, it's very nice. I love uh, the lecture from Buddha. Why God. Very, very good. Very, for me, very good. <laughs> Yes, yes, good. Yes. Karuna Priya is the most uh, loyal uh, class uh, students in the class. <laughs> yeah. She's always there, never misses. Gopika is there? I saw Gopika, yes. Yes, good. I'm here. I'm planting trees, That's so I'm nice. listening same time. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you planting trees? I to make beautiful backside where you look. Oh my God. We are planting here. We plant one tree. <laughs> beautiful. We talked about this. So nice. But I'm listening. I, I was so inspiring, Bhaya. Thank you for sharing. So it goes and to... I, hmm? I just had a. I, I I actually been it I've been meditating a lot about time lately and so it was so nice that this was just about this topic and um, I just thought how extremely overwhelming all these figures are and all these numbers and it's kind of those moments when you same when you lie on the back and stare at the stars and you just feel how <laughs> teeny tiny we are in this enormous creation mm. and um, and then it reminds us very much about living in the here and now in the spiritual right. the abhideha in the spiritual in the soul mm. because then that is the when we live in the here and now we really can be um, in the eternal and when we are in the future or when we think about the past then we immediately go in this spiral of uh, 
these huge numbers and <laughs> we get, you know, we fall out of that, uh, of the, like we fall into that realm, which is too overwhelming of material creation. Yeah. So I guess yeah. that's what, once you, one, when you will touch upon all the chapters about devotion, we can really learn the tools of how to live in the spiritual, in the eternal. Mm. Let's hope. Oh, now I'm getting it free on my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, no, the, thank you, Devaya, for these no, classes. It's so wonderful. Good. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to translators um, as well. That's Madhuya Rasa and Radha Charan. It's really wonderful service you do. I know it's very challenging. Okay, Radhe Radhe, stay close. Much love. Thank you, Gurudev. Tandavat.